lovely. Um, and I'll uh, prepare to open Panopto. And we'll start in about five minutes. So if you want to breathe and relax for five minutes, then I'll come back and introduce everyone. Okay? Great. Okay, just to let you know uh, that we have now started the live stream. Hello. Can you hear me all, the speakers? Yes, can hear you. Yes, we can. Yeah, we can. <laughs> Lovely. Um, could Ephraim try speaking to hear his quality? Ephraim, could you speak a bit? Hello, Ephraim. Um, Let me unmute it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, you're still. It was on. it was mute, and for me it is very clear. I can for see me? you clearly, and I can listen clearly. Lovely. I can hear you. Thank you. Great. I believe that uh, the technicalities look quite good. Um, I will raise a bit the audio on my computer just to make sure that. Ephraim, would you like to speak one more time? Yes. Lovely. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. think, I think it works, it works very well. I'm just double yeah. checking the audio uh, intensity and the volume. Um, so I'll give it just one more minute for, uh, uh, to, to get to two o'clock and start just on time for those who are joining us live and not to cheat with a few minutes ahead. For those who have joined us, welcome. I hope that the audio is okay. Uh, if you're facing any, any issues, please um, email me at ri5 at soas.ac.uk. Um, let us know if you, uh, you have any trouble and what we could improve. Uh, but do uh, know that we are also recording a high quality video of this session, which will be released afterwards. This is Romina Strati speaking. It feels like a radio broadcast. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting role to have. So um, it's almost two o'clock. Uh, welcome everyone. This is the webinar, Research for Development in the era of COVID-19, Challenges and Possibilities. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, we hope that you are keeping well and healthy wherever you're joining us from. Uh, thank you for finding the time. Thank you for the interest you've shown. Uh, it sh it's, it's reassuring that the, the issues we're raising in this uh, webinar uh, resonate with you all uh, and that you're interested to be part of this. My name is Romina Strati and I will be your host for today. I'm currently based at SOAS, teaching at the intersection of gender development and uh, religious studies, and I'm also SOAS's GCRF officer currently. Um, before I introduce the topic and the speakers for today, just a few logistical matters. Um, if you are so a staff, you are welcome to post questions during the discussion using the Panopto screen uh, that you're, you're watching right now. Um, you need to sign in and then you go to the section discussion and post your question. 
If you're a guest, uh, you are welcome to um, tweet uh, at the hashtag R4D series, uh, or you are welcome to email me as well at ri5 at soas.ac.uk. So I'll now move to uh, welcome our speakers. Uh, there you go. How, can you all see me? Yes, welcome everyone. Um, so in terms of uh, logistical matters, I just wanted to say very briefly uh, that we're using a combination of live streaming and video conferencing technology. The audio has been good, but if, if we do, it, if, if it does become slow, give us a few minutes uh, to, to, um, uh, for, for it to improve and um, hopefully uh, you will, um, will be able to continue smoothly. Um, so today's webinar is part of a seminar series uh, that we have, um, we, we established late last year uh, together with the University of Oxford uh, in order to um, address more systematically ethical and practical issues that seem to emerge in international collaborative research, but especially development oriented research. A, a very significant event we held in September, which brought together um, funding bodies, uh, research directors and researchers attempted to apply a decolonial lens to research practice. Uh, and, and that led to many, uh, you know, various problematizations around how we work with local partners in low and middle income countries and uh, evidence that certain bad practices continue. Bad practices that Linda Tuhiwai Smith had already outlined in her book, Decolonizing Methodologies in 1999. So many of these practices continue today. And we set up this series with Oxford essentially to create a platform to continue the conversation and have specialists from different parts of the world join and build knowledge together and better practices, uh, but also to bridge the funding bodies with the research offices, uh, the research development side, with research practice and field work. Um, so obviously with the current virus outbreak, we were sort of forced to um, turn to the current situation. And what we'd like to do uh, now for the, for the next, year, next few seminars is to explore how research institutions and funding bodies could be sensitized or refocused to the particular challenges faced uh, by low and middle income countries, especially in view of the funding schemes that are available, such as the Global Challenges Research Fund, which Robert, you can correct me, I think is a 1.5 billion fund for about five years uh, time. Um, and, you know, we would like to essentially uh, see how um, we could uh, uh, support our partners better in this time. So what we could do to adapt and become per perhaps more flexible in these times, but also with awareness of the historical inequalities and asymmetries that have defined international development, uh, humanitarian aid, and, and actually scientific knowledge production in general. So uh, we would like to see how we can continue supporting partners uh, uh, in this crisis, but with, uh, with, uh, in, in ways that can actually promote local leadership and overcome these asymmetries. Uh, for this session, in particular, we want to explore connections between the public health crisis and wider development issues and livelihoods challenges, um, but also the effects of the crisis on and the challenges that it poses for international development oriented uh, programs or research uh, and how again funding arrangements and institutional practices could adapt uh, to uh, support egalitarian collaborative uh, research globally. I will not repeat the specific questions of uh, the advert, but I will address them uh, to the specific speakers as I uh, invite you to speak. So um, I'd like to welcome now the speakers. Uh, apologies for monopolizing. Uh, we first have Dr. Alex Lewis, who is uh, Director of Research at SOAS. Um, Alex has been very keen to promote, you know, our decolonizing research initiative at SOAS. Uh, and she has been, you know, really adamant about us um, reevaluating our research practices and how we support partners in low and middle income countries. Uh, then we have um, Robert, Felstead, I hope I pronounced that well, uh, at the, um, who is head of GCRF challenges at UKRI. Uh, he previously worked at EPSRC as senior portfolio manager for manufacturing sustainable industries and new industrial systems. Uh, he has a scientific background in chemistry. Um, then we have the pleasure to uh, also host Professor Kevin Marsh, who is professor of tropical medicine, uh, Newfield Department of Medicine, University of Oxford, 
He has spent most of his career leading research on health in Africa. He is uh, also director of the Africa Oxford um, Initiative, which supports the development uh, of equitable partnerships between African um, researchers and colleagues in, in Oxford. And he's senior advisor to the African Academy of Sciences. Welcome. Um, we also are privileged to have um, two partners joining us from Kenya and Ethiopia, uh, respectively. We have um, Dr. Judy Omombo. Uh, I hope I said that well, <laughs> uh, Judy, uh, who currently works as program manager for the affiliates and postdoctoral programs at the African Academy of Sciences. Judy has over 20 years of experience uh, in epidemiologic research, focusing on data-driven decision-making uh, for disease uh, control programs in Africa. And she has served on several global and African panels that advise African governments on climate policy. Good to have you, Judy. Um, and uh, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Ephraim Tesema, uh, who is a social development specialist in Ethiopia. Ephraim has degrees in the social sciences from Addis Ababa University and the Universitat Basile in Switzerland. Uh, he has been involved in socioeconomic development programs in Ethiopia for many decades and currently working with Agri Team Canada in Addis Ababa as a gender specialist. Welcome, Ephraim. Good to have you. And <laughs> Kwanbadekhmamatu. <laughs> Great. Okay, um, so I don't want to linger any anymore. Uh, let's jump into the discussion. So I'd like to invite uh, Ephraim um, to speak first, if that's okay. Um, dear Ephraim, I know you since 2012, uh, when you were working on the IPMS program uh, to support uh, small-scale farmers uh, with livelihoods in, in ways that consider gender differentials. And I think you would be the most equipped to tell us, to give us a better sense of what this public crisis a public health crisis has translated in terms of livelihoods challenges and what kind of sustainable development um, issues it raises, but also whether it points to other needs in terms of uh, development-oriented research that needs to, to, to occur currently in order to support those efforts. And can I remind you to unmute yourself when you respond? <laughs> uh, thank you, Romina, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I may not be a good speaker on this uh, current situation because there are a lot of uh, experts uh, and the frontline extension, health extension workers and the medics who are struggling to uh, safeguard the uh, safety of the uh, public. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the topic that you have given me is uh, very pertinent to my area of engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can... Uh, so a few, a few points. Uh, first of all, when this uh, plague, uh, you know, become global, it has taken us by su surprise. Mm -hmm. For most people, it is like, you know, uh, a dream, a nightmare. And most people, after one month, one colleague asked me, when I wake in the night, I ask myself, is this real or something which is you know the media and uh, some corners of you know some some groups really uh, try to confuse us and so still uh, more than more than the, the impacts of you know the infection people are you know psychologically uh, become very timid uh, and our social life is really jeopardized as you know mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like uh, the rest of africa in Ethiopia, our life is always based on, you know, a uh, kind of communion, kind of you know, rendezvous um, during the meal time, during working time, mm -hmm. uh, be it in the rural area as well as in the in the urban area. So now the rules that the government gave us, the public, you know, uh, medics gave us, uh, has become really uh, problematic for us to adapt. Sometimes even somebody may rush to, 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 to you and to, uh, to, to take your hand or to hug you. So uh, little by little, gradually, now people are uh, trying to learn how to live with the danger of you know, uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to this uh, the topic, the social development issues, including the project I'm working on, we, we, we can't move on as we planned because Movements are uh, restricted uh, within the offices. Only essential staff 
are allowed to uh, get into uh, the offices, uh, the entire government offices. Without those, those partners, key partners, it is very difficult to push on our development plans. For example, I work in four regions, uh, more than 150 districts, and many, many <laughs> hundreds of uh, localities in Kabbalists. Mm -hmm. So this time, uh, transportation is restricted. If you want to go by car from Addis to any region, you pay double because that transporter should decrease the number of people, half, mm -hmm. so that vac vacant place should be paid. So first of all, it brings a burden on uh, the one who move on the, the different places. The other one is, it is also very difficult for the government to uh, oversight because it's where we're living in a big country with different or diverse uh, cultures and experiences. Uh, given that, for example, those who are working as farmers, they are in a big problem because first of all, the value chain for some, some products like horticulture has become you know, totally failed because farmers do not get input because there is no movement from uh, the, the districts and the regions to transport them uh, inputs and also the product value is becoming very low. One quintal of, for example, cabbage was, before COVID, was 300 Ethiopian birds. Maybe it is, it is maybe uh, some 90, 90 uh, dollars. But now it has decreased into only 100 dollars. Because it is not because of uh, only transportation, because uh, most you know, uh, retailers and also wholesalers are not in interacting. Mm -hmm. But there are also rumors, misinformation that if you devour, eat something raw, <laughs> the, the virus is, you know, maybe catch you. So mm -hmm. there are, you know, even when you translate some of the things from the medics, when it goes to the local level, it has different meanings. So mm -hmm. now people have their own you know, way of interpreting uh, uh, some, some messages. There are also, even for the urban urban uh, young people, there are also some uh, media, some mediums like, you know, this YouTube mm -hmm. that showers a lot of, you know, misinformation. So uh, one thing, the farmers are in problem, especially those poor, poor farmers, because uh, first of all, uh, the poor farmers not only work on their uh, farms, they also sell their labor including their, their woman. So there is no one now wants to uh, receive you as, as a worker. And also those who are working on the farm, these migrant workers, they are no more there because they, they left the area and they retreated to, to some, some kind of uh, safe haven. Mm -hmm. And the labor, the labor migration has its own, you know, uh, the movement is restricted. Uh, that means uh, farmers do not get labor they, they don't get input. And this means, by implication, the female uh, value chain actors, including the retailers, the poor retailers, who are sitting along the road from Addis up to Awasa, some 250 kilometers, they can't anymore vend these fruits and vegetables. Because, first of all, there is no car rushing all day in that area. No passengers coming and picking your tomato, your uh, red paper. So these people are uh, really in problem and they need a lot of support. And at the same time, nutrition uh, crisis is uh, slowly uh, deepening because uh, we don't get fresh uh, fruits, even for the middle class and the others. The, the disease also, the, the, the plague also needs us to uh, immunize ourselves in different ways. Mm. Uh, just to share you my experience, now it, even it changes our food culture. Within these three two months, Ethiopians started go back to uh, 100 years of their, you know, this boiled, you know, uh, spices. Uh, we take, you know, we prepare uh, different kinds of, you know, recipe 
uh, to fight back this, this influenza because we have 100 years of experience. Our forefathers you know, left a lot of formulas, even if it is, it is uh, by word of mouth. Uh, the, other, the other thing is not only the challenges, mm -hmm. but there are also opportunities we saw. For example, <laughs> look, now we are virtually uh, organized meeting. In my organization, mm -hmm. my supervisors in Canada, uh, and also my friends in four regions, of, uh, uh, Amahara, Oromia, South, uh, uh, we sit together using Zoom, mm -hmm. and now we plan the next time, instead of meeting our partners, we can also do this with different districts, those who have access to the PC and also the internet, we can also do that. Now people also, farmers also, and the uh, uh, wholesalers, try to use smartphones mm -hmm. and negotiate, you know, uh, markets. So uh, you see a lot of creativity around uh, this COVID-19. Uh, and the other issue I want to uh, uh, raise is leadership at different levels is very important. Mm -hmm. Empathy, togetherness, and you know, sharing even, even, even whatever you have is very important. Even a smile is very, very supportive because still we, we see when I leave my office, I see people who want to get some, some coins, some, some alms. So, so still they are sane, still they are okay because people are supporting. Yes. And Ephraim, thank you so much. Uh, I, we, I could hear, to, listen to you all day. <laughs> we, we, are, we have very limited time, but I yeah. think you did, you did very well to convey to us the situation on the ground, especially how it affects small-scale uh, small farmers, you know, value chain systems, food systems, and that it, it really brings holistic change, right, in, 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 terms, of, uh, in terms of local development. Um, so I uh, please stay on the line because we will return probably with questions later on. I'd like to invite next Judy, who, who is in Kenya currently in Nairobi, um, to tell us a bit, to focus a bit on the inter uh, on the research side of it. Uh, so obviously Ephraim is doing hands-on development locally, uh, but the current changing situation that he described obviously probably generates new challenges also for research and development-oriented research projects. Uh, Judy, you sit at the uh, African Academy of Sciences. I imagine that you have a lot of researchers coming to you reporting challenges or concerns that they have and how this has impacted local research projects that are ongoing or development programs um, and, and their capacity to deliver also, right? Because there's high expectations on the other side, especially if these are collaborative projects. Do you want to give us a sense of what these challenges have been, how COVID-19 has, has impacted uh, on research that is development oriented and, and the local researchers capacity to deliver? Well, thanks. Thanks, Romini. Um, for sure, I've been thinking through the question around the impacts on, on, our, on our research projects and the capacity of the local partners to be involved and to deliver in mm -hmm. the region. And for sure, COVID-19 has had a huge impact. Uh, it's difficult to do your research when you can't go to your, you can't go to your lab, you can't uh, work with your communities that your, your, work, your, research, your research is involved in, and many things um, that impact researchers anywhere across the continent and of course being at the African Academy of Sciences is a sort of privileged vantage point where we can get uh, a view of what's going across, uh, on across Africa really. Mm. So the impacts that are negative have been huge and I think those ones are obvious but they're also as my colleague Efren mentioned there have been also many huge opportunities emerging. Uh, we see the development of, of hand sanitizers just from low-tech things, hand sanitizers that are being uh, developed here, they're locally developed on the continent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in Nairobi, for example, you can still find hand sanitizers in the shops. Um, to innovations in uh, making our own face masks, which are, you know, another very low, low uh, hanging fruit. Um, innovative ways to self distance in, in, in shops, uh, in communities, in markets, and so on. To more uh, advanced things like testing kits being developed uh, in Africa affordable uh, ventilators mm -hmm. and even societal compliance to guidelines. I mean, this is something that we, we research, particularly in the area of, of health in a situation like this, that we shouldn't take for granted. Behavior and the study of behavior around, around the changes in behavior uh, when something like this happened is really important. We, we find 
people, people are being compliant in general with many things, you know, the government comes in and says stay home and people stay home. Of course, there'll be a few who still want to go out and party, but you know, in general, most people comply with these things. And I think a, a lot has to do uh, with properly, properly uh, delivered health messages, which mm -hmm. is also an area of research that's very important for something like this. And then to the other extreme end and, and much more complicated, you have geno se genome sequencing happening on the continent within a week, mm -hmm. sequence, and uh, discussions around vaccine development. So there's a lot that Africa has, has responded to in this crisis, you know, really given the opportunity to say, okay, it's, it's, it's really bad and what can we do? And what can our local, our local uh, partners uh, do to, to avert a lot that's happening? Now, Africa has been able to buy some time uh, mm -hmm. measures. And this has really allowed a scientist to start looking at the epidemiology and thinking through. At the academy, we, we are putting out calls, for example, that, that uh, we see that scientists are responding to, African scientists are responding to research calls to, to enable, um, enable, enable the continent to, to look at things like social distancing. Mm -hmm. Is it really something that is, is relevant for our setting? Um, do we need to know what's out there, you know, conduct actual, actual epidemiological studies to find out what is your actual risk? If you go out, uh, you start thinking about lifting lifting the, the ban on movement and, and all sorts of all sorts of things like that. Um, and indeed, what is a case? You know, is a case uh, somebody with symptoms, or is it a case who is, is somebody who is positive with the virus? Uh, which case do we need to find out how many people are actually positive, and what does that mean? Mm. What when you tell somebody that they're positive? Does it mean that you've got to worry about uh, 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 quarantining yourself, really? Or you know, are, you ex are you at great risk to your family? All these things need to be defined in practical ways for people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, all these protocols are not defined yet. Uh, and even things like uh, what can scientists do to allay the fear that is mm -hmm. that's, that is really hampering hampering uh, uh, government's efforts to, to, control, to control the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Still quite, there is a lot, but you know, as I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, it, it's great to, to be able to report that Africa is responding, the, science, the researchers are responding in a very, very uh, strong, strong way, and uh, we're making lots of gains. Thank you, Judy. It's, uh, it's amazing that your overview in such li limited time is uh, really insightful. I've been following uh, the reports from various African countries or just reading on, on Senegal's approach, which has been quite science driven uh, and various others example, other examples uh, of, of timely approaches, approaches that are customized to the specific conditions of the countries. Even here in, in the UK, we have uh, multiple complaints about the political response, right? So uh, we can actually learn, reverse the knowledge transfer currently and I think this is where we're really trying to promote here um, and also promote the understanding that one size never fits all and everyone has to uh, you know um, um, mobilize local specialization know-how and effort to address it so thank you so much you spoke so eloquently um, I, and I think Robert actually this ties uh, well with ro what Robert might have to say um, Robert um, you sitting you being the head of GCRF challenges um, how has uh, UKRI responded because I'm pretty sure similar um, thoughts and conversations are going on within your organization of, of what kind of calls to put out you know how to support this kind of research and collaborations and and really promote local readership uh, given also as you know the funding constraints of where the funds can go right the, the practical side of it so could you give us an overview of what UKRI has been doing yeah so so I've got a couple of things to talk about uh, in this session and, and what I'll do is in, in this particular snippet I'll maybe focus on impact on the GCRF portfolio as you mentioned it's 1.5 billion pounds and actually we're in we're now we've just come into the uh, the fifth year of the GCRF so that started uh, this month uh, and so um, you know a lot of our projects are up and running right now uh, and so um, there's obviously significant implications for our projects um, if you look across the whole of the UKRI portfolio, obviously all projects are in some way affected by this. Mm. Uh, and our website is a good resource uh, in terms of the latest information. And we are updating it uh, several times a week at the moment uh, because things are changing so rapidly. 
so we are changing policy and updating policy very very often and so I would encourage people to to check there um, in terms of specifics for for the global challenges research fund uh, it's worth pointing out that it, it is different in a number of ways from the sort of other parts of UKRI funding that we have and in particular uh, it's focused on developing country problems um, and so that in terms of the actual focus of the research obviously then um, the way these grants are impacted is different, particularly because international collaboration is key to almost every single project. Mm -hmm. uh, the vast majority of projects that we have have active collaborations between UK researchers and researchers all over the world. It, it's in over 100 countries. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously that means that um, the sort of research that people are doing will either have to be done differently uh, and there will be certain things that people can't do for the moment. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we recognise that uh, there are some very significant challenges um, and I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll break it down into sort of three different ways, which is uh, three different sort of scenarios. So one is um, projects that are sort of in the middle. In some ways, this is the, the simplest scenario because, um, you know, our, our position at the moment is if you're kind of in the middle of your project, uh, do your best to continue. Uh, uh, we understand some things will be difficult to do and then and then look to extend that project at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for projects that have just started, um, obviously the, there are greater challenges in the sense that you're perhaps trying to recruit people, get things up and running. Um, so our current position is try and start as best as you can uh, and again uh, extend later on uh, when, once we know the, the full impact of everything that you're doing. And then uh, probably the trickiest one and the one that UKRI as a whole is wrestling with at the moment are projects that are coming to an end. Uh, mm -hmm. So ones that have just finished in some ways, it's obviously that's less of a problem, but those that are just about to finish and um, particularly the GCRF, uh, it's towards the end of the project that we hope uh, some more of the impact might come from that project. Um, and so we are looking very seriously at ways that we can try and support those at this difficult time. Um, one thing just to, to be wary of, uh, the UKRI website has policies updated, but those won't necessarily apply to the GCRF. Um, that will be considered separately, and that's because this is a fund that's run um, through our uh, host government department base. Uh, mm -hmm. So we need to make sure um, that, you know, that, that they are sort of happy with what we're doing. Um, but we are looking at that very seriously and I hope to update on that soon. And um, it is useful for you mm -hmm. to tell us what's happening, uh, particularly on those examples of things coming to an end, because if we have examples, then we can use, use those to make various cases. Um, the, the tricky thing is, of course, if things will cost more money, and then the, the question is about where the money comes from. I'll probably come to that in my second bit, actually, because yes. that will be relevant to what we're looking at, particularly in response to the crisis and what uh, we're trying to do with GCRF and to use the GCRF to help respond to the crisis uh, as well. So I'll probably leave it there for now. Yes, Robert, I think uh, it's great. And you have outlined some of the, the key issues. Uh, actually, I had some conversations with Alex Lewis, our director of research at SOAS, um, who actually I think could sort of uh, add to what you said and maybe offer a, a slightly different perspective from the from the point of view of research institutions, right, who have to then respond to what fund, funding bodies like UKRI, UKRI are doing and, uh, and are putting out there. So Alex, may I invite you to uh, then um, uh, tell us what you've dealt with so far, what you've observed in the institution in terms of how our partners have responded and how our principal investigators are, uh, or co-investigators are, are responding to their partners locally. And I'm, I believe that there was an internal survey going on to gather, collect data from our PIs or co-Is on, on challenges and how we could respond to that. So do you want to maybe give us a few ideas? Yep. Or instance? Yes, no, absolutely. And um, firstly, I think I would just like to say thank you for organizing this uh, se uh, the seminar, Romina. It's, uh, it's, you've got a wonderful lineup of people and it's wonderful to hear so many different sort of perspectives during this sort of global pandemic. So um, thank you very much for that. And I think it's been a great transition from our, our joint seminar series with Oxford. Um, but obviously time is uh, pressing on. So I want to address the specific questions uh, that you just raised. Um, and in particular, you, you're correct, you know, we did, um, we did issue a survey very early on when the lockdown was uh, first initiated within the UK and announced and we, we sent out a survey to our grant holders really to try and quickly assess the impact to their research projects. 
Um, and I'll be honest, at that point in time, we were looking at it more from an operational perspective, i.e., you know, can we assess the scale of work that was likely to be necessary and also keep abreast of all of the funders sort of changing terms and conditions and responding to how people are, uh, you know, uh, considering supporting uh, potential things like no cost extensions or, you know, the extending the likely extensions to the grant. So it's very useful to hear uh, from Robert the kind of middle just starting and coming to an end perspective from that perspective as well. Um, so we asked questions around the impact to projects and also to the staff on the projects. Um, but at that point, we weren't really looking, as I said, to that kind of more global impact to the, to the, to the partnerships per se. Um, but I think when I was reviewing the responses, I sort of very rapidly realized that obviously we needed to expand and, and consider the wider implications of, of uh, the sort of mitigating circumstances that our researchers were proposing. Um, and also, you know, what role could SOAS actually play in any sort of damage limitation and, and actually supporting the sort of mitigating steps uh, as, a, as a result of the pandemic. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, there are no immediate and absolute solutions, I think, and, we'll, and many of us are sort of trying to sort of wait and see with, uh, you know, with, with the limited sort of clear directions that are coming out from the governments and stuff. But I do believe that it is key that we are maintaining open dialogue with our partners. Um, and that as institutions, we are making a sort of every effort to understand the local environments uh, that is being researched and that we're listening um, to our partners to understand how we can best support them during these sorts of unprecedented times. And of course, vice versa, how can our partners support us to enable the research and what lessons can we sort of learn through this whole process? I mean, in the majority of the cases from the from the survey, obviously, the, the major thing that came through with the travel disruptions given that the majority of our research is internationally focused, um, you know, there were significant travel plans coming up in the next few months. Um, it's the summer months, it's when researchers tend to travel most. Um, and, um, and, you know, because a lot of these travel plans were going to be canceled, this included the workshops that were being organized, conferences that were going to be canceled or postponed. You know, there's, there's a lot of challenges associated with trying to find alternative dates further down the line to reschedule them potentially. I mean, are they still relevant? You know, people are adapting and being innovative as Judy was describing. And, you know, how do we, how, will the world have changed so much so that actually the research that was originally envisaged, you know, still be the, the key priority. Mm. Um, but I would say that, that that's some of the challenges, but one of the kind of um, positives, if you like, that came from, from reviewing the responses to the survey was that with some of our sort of larger collaborative projects, our partners in the country were actually, you know, very able and willing to take on the lead when we locked down in the UK first. Um, and so there was one case where we had some workshops, I think in Nigeria coming up, and the expectation was the sort of lead PI from UK would travel out there and sort of help coordinate it. Um, but as it turned out, you know, the travel wasn't possible. And so the partners, the workshops went ahead at that time and the partners were able to facilitate those. And by all accounts, they were, uh, you know, incredibly successful. And obviously the UK participated through sort of using Zoom and what have you as well. So, you know, that was a real positive to me. And it kind of described the, um, uh, you know, where we had these really strong international and equitable partnerships, actually things could continue. Um, but I mean, you know, now, of course, um, uh, the lockdowns sort of spread further throughout the world. Um, and, you know, at that point, they weren't happening in Africa. Um, so we were able to do that. Um, but we're certainly in a different place now than when the original sort of survey was conducted. Um, and I've sort of spoken with several of our PIs um, and with some of our partners. And to some extent, I think a lot of people are sort of waiting and seeing how things develop um, and waiting for more clarification from sort of funders and policymakers as to how we can uh, progress with our, with our research. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm sort of interested to hear certainly, you know, what Robert has to say in the, in the next, the next <laughs> as well. in, the, in the next round. Thank you so much. That's, that's great to hear. Um, and, and I think it kind of the situation forced perhaps Western researchers to take a step back and trust their, their partners locally. Right. And I think we've, I think we tend to take maybe this epistemology uh, leads a researcher to think that they should be leading at all times, but, but we have to be humble to work equitably. And that means taking the step back and allowing those who know best and are, are, are better uh, equipped to deal with the situation to take the lead. So, so this was a really interesting case study to hear. I'm sure Kevin has a lot to say on this, who is our next speaker. I mean, 
and Kevin, you have been uh, supporting uh, research development in Africa for, for the biggest chunk of your career. Um, what kind of uh, needs there might be? I mean, we're looking at a lot of researchers in low and middle income countries taking the lead, being very active, being very creative. What, what are there, are there any needs that we could complement and, and, you know, uh, help strengthen? And what do you think could funding bodies and institutions do to, to uh, help that, that process and that effort? Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for inviting me, inviting me to be part of this. I must say that when I was first asked to reflect about what the crisis reveals about um, research systems in NMICs, I reminded myself, as one often has to do, that you have to be very cautious about this whole concept that you can talk about research systems in LMIC as if it was some mm -hmm. sort of singular concept. Obviously, LMICs are enormously diverse geographically, politically um, and culturally. And even if I you know, restrict myself to Africa, where I have spent most of my career, the same is true, of course. I mean, it's a massive continent, 54 countries, enormous diversity, and research institutions themselves are diverse. We tend often to reflect about the under-resourced institutions, but there are world, there are world leading institutions in, in Africa too, sometimes in the same country as the under-resourced ones. So that's mm -hmm. just a caveat to say that I think we have to be careful about generalizing mm -hmm. when we talk about the effect on LMICs. Okay. And so with that qualification, my response to the first bit, I, I suspect Rubina might disappoint you um, and the organizers, because we have to say, what, what does the crisis reveal? And I, I suspect it doesn't reveal very much at all that we didn't already know. I mean, and the reason for that is fairly obvious, because the challenges that face research systems are a matter of everyday experience, and they're very long term processes to deal with them. So I actually don't think we'll learn very much about research systems. Uh, mm -hmm. But one thing I do think we it will bring in, in to focus and be more make more explicit is something we do know, which is the over dependence on external funding. Um, yeah. Now this is not simply a concern that um, LMIC researchers might find themselves at the back of the queue for funding. Um, uh, what I think what is a concern is that when you're dependent on external funding, you have far less autonomy in setting the research um, agenda. And I think this relates not simply to research on COVID, but actually, in some ways, more importantly, research in other areas. Mm -hmm. Because I think one thing we have to be very careful about, and I realize I'm probably in a bit of a minority here, is, but I actually don't um, totally, unhold, you know, sort of without reservation, welcome the move in a way for many funders to redirect funding streams mm -hmm. towards COVID and LMIC. Now, I don't want to be mis misunderstood here, uh, COVID is a global emergency, we need to respond to it and everyone is responding to it. But <clears throat> I think we need to bear in mind that the rest of the development research agenda does not go away. <clears throat> Malaria will not become less important, HIV won't be less important, adolescent health, sexual reproductive health, maternal mortality, none of these things will suddenly sort of be less important. But there is a real danger that will direct funding away from them in the long term and the LMIC institutions are more susceptible to this redirection because they are historically over dependent on external funding. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the thing we need to be aware of. <clears throat> the second reflection is actually fits very well with most of my colleagues and I'm happy to see that, um, particularly with Judy's reflection, which perhaps isn't surprising because we work together in the same <laughs> um, And that is that um, a real sense of positivity and, and optimism in the way the crisis is revealing um, uh, the way that research capacity in Africa has changed very dramatically. And I'm not just talking about technical capacity, but also um, capacity in terms of strategic thinking and research governance. And I think this is really a very positive side of a response to the crisis. I think we've probably all been struck, as you always are in these situations, um, over the last few weeks, that there's been a real resurgence of the sort of Africa is a disaster narrative but it's not just restricted to some parts of the international media. I'm afraid this is also coming out from some institutions um, involved with development who should really know better than to, than to, than to pander to this you know, um, in a well-intentioned attempt to direct funds towards it. And of course, it's turning out that that's not, it's not helpful. I mean, it never is helpful, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's also particularly misplaced in, in, uh, in the COVID situation. But there is a parallel narrative, which I think we all have to guard against falling into, which has you know, some resonances with that. And that's the idea that African research systems are weak and unable to respond. Um, now, again, I'm not for a second pretending 
that there isn't a scandalous lack of investment by governments in research or that there's not far too few researchers in Africa. That is absolutely true. But I think what's really struck us is the incredible um, positivity, speed and energy with which African research, and by African research I mean individuals, institutions and the networks that bring them together, have responded to the crisis. And as an example of that, I just my final point, I just want to briefly mention um, um, maybe of interest to some of the people tuning in, um, an exercise that we've mounted very quickly in the academy about defining research priorities. I'm sure mm -hmm. lots of people are aware of the WHO uh, roadmap for research priorities for COVID, which involved over 300 experts uh, defining a whole set of a research agenda. And at the time this was done, it was for quite understandable reasons, because the focus at that time was on China and Europe. Um, Africa was hardly involved at all in, in that. In that, in that process. Um, now, this is not just simply carping about not being invited to the party, um, or, or even about fairness, although fairness is extraordinarily important. But it's really important to recognize that funding will be driven by whatever people think the priorities are. And if the priorities of low and income countries, and in our case, the countries in Africa, are not reflected in the global priorities, then funding won't flow in that direction. So we undertook a rapid and extensive open consultation exercise, uh, beginning with a webinar with over 250 researchers from across the continent, moving quickly to a survey, an open source survey, which uh, uh, again, as a reflection of the energy with which this is being regarded, we had over 800 complete responses in four days. Um, and that has resulted in a publication which people want to consult on on our website, which looks at mm -hmm. the whole issue of priorities um, in, in Africa, including a whole set of new priorities which came out of that consultation. Mm -hmm. So I think the message from that experience is that there is real energy and commitment um, across African research um, to respond to COVID. And I think this is really positive. So your final question, I think the answer is pretty obvious from what I've said, because you said, what should institutions and funders do in response to this? And I think they should do what they should have been doing all along. Um, and some have and some haven't, but often not with enough energy. And that is engaging equitably with partners in, in low and income countries to define the research agenda and not to make knee-jerk responses in order to show that we're doing something. It's very tempting to do that. If you're a research group or if you're a funder, it's very tempting to say, we've got to respond to this. Mm -hmm. and there's a real danger at the moment of over-response and uh, there's a real need for coordination of response. So to me, that's the message that comes out, out of this. Well, I really appreciate that you were able, you, you were part of this and you could make those points, you know, really uh, eloquently better than we could say it. These are some of the issues that emerged at our past events that, you know, the narrative is always defined by the Western funders who are usually based in high income societies. Uh, the distribution of funding itself is an equal, obviously. And the narrative, the conceptualization of the issues, even this idea of global challenges is defined within the, you know, the wider mainstream political agenda around development. So I think you're making absolutely fair point that this might actually be an opportunity uh, for UKRI and, and funders that, that, uh, that aim to make funding available for development to really find a way to work with the local research lead leadership to formulate those calls if, you know, or, or any other initiative that they might consider. It, it might be some option uh, to think about, and Robert can speak to that when we get there. But thank you so much, Kevin. It, it was invaluable. R Romina, um, I don't know if you're getting these messages. I've just been flashed a message from colleagues in, in Oxford saying that oh. they, can't, they can't hear the presentations. <laughs> I don't know if that's a local issue or, or, oh. or what, but I've just mentioned it to you in case there is some general problem. Um, it may be a local problem. So I just, far, I... Um, I've received um, a colleague saying that your voice is breaking up a bit, but they can hear me well. So it might be okay. uh, the connection okay. momentarily, because yeah. um, I get a lot of wind next to me. It's rainy season, it's rainy weather as well. Okay. And I think the internet is a bit unstable. Okay, uh, I was but, just going to mention uh, that. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. And this is being recorded on my device. So there will be a high quality video as well available later on for your Great. colleagues. Um, that we will distribute. Um, so can I also invite Judy to to maybe add to what you said, Kevin, uh, since, you know, you seem to sort of agree in many, many of the things you say, but also, uh, you know, offer very diverse perspectives. Uh, Judy, you know, there is, look, you're smiling. 
um, you know, in what you see in terms of needs and, and um, uh, the current creativity, how can that be accommodated? What is, what uh, might be, uh, you know, is it, in, is there need in terms of resources? You know, because obviously the creativity and the work is there and, and the ideas are there. What else do you think could be done in this situation, especially from, from our part and, and the side of the international development, which has always been quite arrogantly, I would say, if I may, I'm allowed, assuming that they know the, the panaceas, you know, in the solutions. Um, what would you advise? Well, um, there's a lot of talk always about listening to partners, understanding local context and, and uh, collaborative research that's equitable. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, letting, letting Africa lead the research, but Africa doesn't want to lead somebody else's research, you know, Africa would like to lead our own research. And as Kevin has said, you know, we, we are perfectly capable of defining our own priorities. And I think the issue is around where the money comes from. If somebody mm. can you, they own you, um, um, kind of thing, but it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. If it's truly equitable collaboration, it must start with the collaboration coming from Africa. So this is why we have a lot of problems when somebody says, oh, we're going to test a vaccine somewhere. Mm -hmm. Face of that. Mm -hmm. Much as it's an excellent research, and this is really what we need, you know, this is really the, the bullet that's going to sort out the problem. It's not going to be accepted. It's a challenge to accept it. Mm -hmm. So moving away from always feeling that Africa just needs money mm -hmm. to meant some research that has been done everywhere as somewhere else yeah. you know the days when there was no capacity in africa are over the capacity is there now and if it's small and even if there are some challenges in research systems and so on we must starting from the continent and do you think that so what about the funding bodies such as the global challenges research fund which is the scheme available uh, what do you think they could what role can they play should they exist or not at all at this time what do you think i don't know one can't say that that anybody who's funding research shouldn't ex shouldn't mm. exist it's more discussing a, a more workable way of, of, mm -hmm. of being truly equitable with this research you mm -hmm. see this this crisis you know well, we, I do agree with many things with, with Kevin, but I, I think the crisis has revealed quite a lot. You know, I, th I think there, there was a lot of pessimism on, on how Africa is going to manage. Oh, when this hits the poor communities on the continent, everybody's going to be dying in droves. And we've not seen that, you know, we've not seen that. You know, we're able to, to launch a response. We're able to mobilize governments. We're able to mobilize ministries of health. And uh, we're able to mobilize uh, researchers from this continent who we work with every day to respond uh, from different, different, uh, different disciplines. So mm -hmm. I think really just changing that narrative of, of Africa's capacity and ability. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thank you for praxistically doing that. You're changing the narrative, you're embodying that change. So thank you so much. Um, and I think I know what you mean in terms of more equitable. One, one one of the things we discussed in the previous events is how funding could be allocated in a way that is not always given to the UK-based institution, which is, as you know, Robert, a requirement for most GCRF calls, especially the thematic calls. Uh, it, it, how could we make it so that funds are received directly locally? And, you know, because usually the budget holder makes all the decisions. And I think that's the reality that we need to admit. Um, so, Robert, can can I invite you to, to tell us what you think? I mean, what kind of um, flexibility is there? And, and do you think the UKRI could operate differently in some ways, given that you also have to respond to UK policies, right, and, and expectations? So what kind of flexibility is there? Yeah, there's, a, there's okay, so quite a lot of stuff to discuss there. And not really time, <laughs> there was. So be as succinct as I can. And so um, just very briefly, I'll chat on the UK side. So obviously UKRI is quite heavily involved in the UK focused response. And that is a quite rapid uh, and aggressive response, all from um, uh, rapid research projects, repurposing of existing research projects, and even um, direct work, uh, you know, looking to uh, manufacture ventilators at our research sites, as well as supporting businesses to do so. So we've, uh, and you know, and there's a huge number of, you know, obviously research is absolutely the center of this response and we're doing a huge amount of work uh, with the research community and to support the research community and the innovation community to, to deal with these massive challenges that are facing the UK right now. Um, so 
I think it's worth just to reflect that that is kind of, I guess, the primary thing that we are focused on and doing. Now, when it comes to the international side of things, um, I suppose it's worth thinking that um, we operate um, the Global Challenges Research Fund, but we also have the Newton Fund and the Fund for International Collaboration. And those are just three funds that we use for, for international collaboration. Uh, and we have a network of partners and, and we, we fund in all sorts of different ways. So we fund in partnership with other funding organisations and we also directly fund uh, uh, researchers and some, some of our schemes do directly overseas, but that's a kind of a, that's been going up over time. So it started off very low um, with perhaps just the Medical Research Council doing it and bits of the, the Natural Environment Research Council and the Economic and Social Research Council. And then kind of over, over time, you know, the whole of UKRI can do this now. Um, we don't do it on every call, but that's kind of the direction of travel. And, and there are various reasons and complications around that, which I, I don't have time to go into uh, here. Um, um, but it's certainly something that we're very serious about. I guess the challenge that COVID-19 brings is this need to act strategically and equitably and really, really fast. Um, and so, and we are under pressure to, to act really, really fast. I think um, we've already done some things on the GCRF, so the, uh, the money that goes straight to universities, which uh, and that's the QR allocations, universities are allowed to do whatever they want with this money, as long as it's within the spirit of their priorities under the GCRF uh, and it's ODA compliant. <laughs> developing countries, um, they can repurpose some of that money already uh, to, mm -hmm. to 19, so we've told them that they can do that. Um, beyond that then, you know, things across UKRI, um, we're looking at things uh, across departments because uh, uh, this isn't just, uh, you know, UKRI sits under the business department, but we also have the Department of Health very heavily involved in this, obviously, uh, and of course the Department for International Development, so we're talking across each other about ways that we can work together uh, and we've had a lot of discussions with our international funding partners who are very interested in this as well so we're not short of ideas uh, and we are keen to do things um, I guess where we are at the moment is trying to make sure that we do these in the right way so things do need to be equitable um, if we do anything, it needs to be safe as well. So, um, and the fact is that, you know, a lot of our research projects at the moment are struggling uh, to get on uh, because of this crisis. If we're going to fund anything in response, it needs to be able to do it. Um, so it needs to be feasible. Uh, and so there are certain, you know, constraints around that that we have to, to deal with. Uh, and um, the other point, which was also brought up, is that you're not... Yeah, absolutely. You do not want to throw the whole development agenda uh, out of the window just because of one crisis, no matter how this crisis is. You know, um, the GCRF uh, is a significant fund. It has a number of uh, priority areas uh, and a lot of investment, and we're keen to see those investments succeed. Um, of course, we pay attention to this crisis, um, particularly uh, given that one of the objectives of the Global Challenges Research Fund is agile response to emergencies. Mm -hmm. We have to bear that in mind um, that, you know, this is an opportunity um, for the GCRF to make a difference. Um, but, you know, with all of those different constraints that, you know, we have to try and get this right. Um, and there is the other issue of where the money comes from. Um, so we do have to make sure that the money is available and we have to talk to government about mm -hmm. that. Um, I guess one thing to throw in there uh, perhaps for, for a, another conversation another day, one thing we are aware of is that our money is part of the um, international development budget. Mm -hmm. uh, the budget is tied to the economic performance of the UK. Uh, and so that is something that we are thinking uh, in the future about mm -hmm. what that might mean. Uh, and that, you know, the GCRF is a, is a small part of that, um, but it is something that we've also been thinking about. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I think I've covered what I, I wanted to say. Um, obviously, you know, we are keen to do something and to do something quickly. So, you know, do look out on the website. Um, but yeah. hopefully in five minutes, I outlined all the kind of... <laughs> yes, it's okay. I think we can go five minutes overboard. Just to note that uh, internet connection has been very unstable. So some people are not getting the right audio on their side, but we will release the recording afterwards. So hopefully you'll be able to rewatch this. It's quite short uh, and catch up with the discussion. Uh, you can tell, you can let your colleagues know. Um, I, I, I just listening to you, Robert, I'm wondering, and we have Judy and Kevin here in terms of, you know, the African Academy of Sciences. Is there any, uh, in, any effort on parts on the part of the UKRI to work with local research 
bodies and you know funding distributors against delivery bodies is there direct contact with the Ac african academy of sciences for instance since you're both here uh, would that be a way forward in your opinion and what you've seen is it something that you're exploring yeah we we're, we're in discussions with quite a number of so the good thing is that we have partnerships with a range of organizations so mm -hmm. we have uh, obviously the Newton countries and we have also have a partnership with the African Research Universities Alliance uh, and the African Sciences. So we, we have a number of uh, partners that we've been talking to uh, uh, in the research side and also on the research into policy side within the as well. So there's a, there's a big range of people. Uh, in fact, we've had discussions that we've, we've had to put also quite a lot of internal effort into sort of uh, collating and structuring them all to make sure that we can understand the opportunities and try and quickly work out, you know, how and who we can work with. Yeah, so so we are doing that already. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, those conversations are ongoing and very interesting. And I, I guess it's an opportunity. I mean, our aim is to bring you together. Now you know Judy, now you know Kevin, you know, it's good to uh, build that network. Um, and just because we're running out of time, uh, Alex, uh, I think you wanted to say a few more things on how research institutions could respond. Again, on the basis of what you heard so far, um, you you know you have about three minutes. <laughs> I'll try and keep it very short. Um, and I think I think you're absolutely right. I think you know it, it's what Kevin was saying. We should be doing what we should be doing all along. And I think when I was reflecting on some of the discussions from our earlier events and actually the the points that were raised through those, um, such as you know um, you know enabling sort of. Uh, international partners to take the lead to identify what how best to run research projects and you know to identify what those issues are was one of the key points of discussion from one of our very early uh, webinars back in November actually um, and so to keep it short I think our institutions sh should be doing more to support you know basically building equitable and long-lasting partnerships based on the evidence um, or the discussions I've had with some of our uh, you know uh, PIs as such on these large collaborative grants where they spent years building relationships with people you know, they seem to have, you know, had that kind of most robust partnership and um, able to be resilient towards these kinds of external shocks. So I think as institutions, we should do, we could maybe repurpose, as you say, some of our QRG CRF funding mm -hmm. to support, you know, building and nurturing partnerships from the very start, you know, building in a kind of review and reflect processes and encouraging our academics um, to build that as part of their project timelines. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and just kind of, you know, uh, continue to try and build awareness with funders in particular with some of the unintended consequences perhaps that come out from the terms and conditions and guidance from pools that are sometimes at great pace as we're seeing now um, so I think being able to allow those conversations to happen as well are probably some of the key things that I think our sort of institutions can play a significant role in. Absolutely, and, and I think a, a lot of institutions are having the same conversations currently from what we've seen uh, being in communication with ARMA, the Association of Research Managers in the, in the UK. Everyone is sort of asking the same questions, what they could do better. And I think there is now more awareness, to be honest, about the asymmetries that are ongoing. Uh, I, as you know, I'm also uh, working on, on understanding our, um, how, how we work and, and what kind of pressure our processes place on our partners in terms of due diligence and reporting, which obviously we have to deal with because funders accept, expect so. Um, and, you know, I think it's time for us to, to think of better ways to do things and there, and there must be better ways, you know. Uh, our African and, and Asian and various other partners are being very creative in these times, we should as well as we can. Um, uh, just we have two minutes um, to end and I don't see any questions. I think it has to do with the, the quality of the audio at times. Um, I would, for the last two minutes, uh, can I invite anyone who has any thoughts and afterthoughts uh, or if not uh, Ephraim to say something, to add something to this because you have spoken the least Ephraim. Thank you, but I don't uh, feel uh, marginalized. Don't worry. <laughs> Good. You know, this code is, uh, I said, it has also uh, a side that can change uh, the game that we have in this globe. If, if not totally, at least there will be change. I see a lot of innovation, as Dr. Judy said here. Our health system is responding very much. Uh, the government system, the leadership is very you know, uh, rejuvenated. And there are even very young students producing a number of you know, materials 
uh, to help people to keep their you know uh, cleanliness for example a young man innovated a kind of job that can you know uh, give you water without touching anything around mm -hmm. you know simply a young school boy so uh, sanitizers are produced everywhere in the universities this time and above all the government early warned us so that uh, we couldn't reach at this level if, 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 we, are, if we are late, you see? Uh, so for the researchers, for the donors, uh, it is very good to change the status quo a little bit so that we can be seen as equal partners uh, because this, close, this kind of global uh, crisis uh, really pull us together uh, for the good or the bad. Thank you. Thank you, Efrem. That was very optimistic. I think optimism is good and we need it in our time. And I'm just, I just, uh, Alex brought to my, to my attention that there are some questions on Twitter, which for some reason I can't see. Alex, do you want to, uh, to, to read that? Yeah, sure. Actually, one of the questions was for Efrem, which was, uh, given the struggles you have described among rural agricultural communities, is it ethical for researchers to carry out field work in these communities at this time? Is research helpful or does it overburden communities? I mean, I'm, I recognize we're short on time and that's quite a big question. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe a, a yeah. quick response and then we can... A very quick, one minute yeah. response. Yeah. There are, it, is, it is not, I mean, it is not like before, but there are organizations like IFPRI who are working on you know, horticulture. You can do a mobile phone-based interview using you know, local experts, frontline extension workers, so if not, it is you don't you may not get into you know, contact with people, but you can do using this you know uh, uh, internet based mobile based you know communication. Otherwise, mm -hmm. this time it's difficult to step into the, the rural parts. Thank you. Uh, Alex, if there, so I, I can see that we have about 370 viewers on Panopto, so I'm sure that more people have questions. And because we've run out of time, I'll just ask kindly for everyone to uh, send your questions to me directly if you'd like to, or send them on Twitter, uh, wherever you are. Um, and then we will try to address them on our list serve, which we use uh, for this series. It's the decolonial HE, decolonial higher education at gismail.ac.uk. And again, we can share that with all uh, the participants who have been registered through email. Uh, so please uh, keep those questions coming. And if our kind participant speakers would like to respond to those later on, uh, we'll make an effort to, to, to gather their, their responses for you. So thank you all so much again. Um, I'm sorry if the audio was not perfect for some of our viewers. Uh, we will try to release a, a recording afterwards. Thank you to all our excellent speakers, panelists. Stay safe, stay healthy, uh, best wishes for the months ahead, and please uh, keep talking to each other. And we will follow up with another uh, session uh, now led by Oxford, the next one led by Oxford, by Mara Murmina, my colleague there. And, and we will pick on some of these points and continue discussing them in the next one. So hopefully we'll preserve the continuity. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Judy, yeah. Rob, Ephraim, uh, Kevin, Thanks. Alex. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.